You ready to come and preach the word, brother? All right. I know he's been preparing for this for a good long while now. Amen. Give him a big hand. Amen. Make him feel welcome. So as many of you can see, I'm not the most, you know, graceful person in the world. Kind of clumsy. <laughs> Appreciate that. When it comes to public speaking, sometimes I get pretty nervous, you know? But honestly, sometimes I get most nervous when I'm sitting down in a one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Because that's when they have the most time to judge you. One-on-one, -on -one, they can say all the stuff they want back to you and criticize you. And don't get me wrong, I take criticism, but it's not always easy to swallow. And one place where you have to take a lot of criticism and you have to really be ready is a job interview. How many of you have ever had a job interview? Yeah, plenty of you. And those who are young enough eventually will. So my job interview I want to talk about, I was at Chick-fil-A, you know, and, you know, they already hold their employees to a higher standard. So I knew a lot of people there, but I was still nervous coming in because I was like, am I going to meet what they want me to be? And I spent all this time studying job qualifications. And there are, you know, a list of things you need to know and be good at at most jobs in order for you to be considered hireable. So a list of some job qualifications are having a strong work ethic, a positive attitude, good communication skills, time management abilities, problem solving skills, acting as a team player, self-confidence, ability to accept and learn from criticism, flexibility slash adaptability, and working well under pressure. I'll go ahead and say I have maybe two or three of these where I'm confident to say I'm good at them. It's, it's a process. Yeah, it's, it's always something we have to work on, but you know, it's just a struggle. I'm sitting there thinking, what can I write that they are gonna like about me that's honest and truthful? And I ended up getting the job, but I'm gonna kind of flip the script for a second. What if there were qualifications for being a Christian. Now, I'm not talking about God's laws and standards. I'm talking about what if you had to meet a certain criteria to become a Christian? Well, who would fit the mold? Because in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, it reads, hearing that Jesus has silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. As one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. As the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It seems simple enough, right? But in all, it's not always that simple. Because in order, you know, loving the Lord God with all your heart and soul and mind, that is one law, but it's a canopy for a bunch of laws in the Bible that we're supposed to follow. And it, it kind of sums it up for us because if we follow that, then we will follow everything else. And if we love our neighbor as ourselves, we will follow everything else. But it doesn't mean there's not subcategories. Because Romans 3.23 goes ahead and says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even if you would have never commit a sin, which is possible, you were born into it. So we're already in need of grace and saving from the beginning. We as humans, we get distracted by lust, by idols, by pride, by greed, jealousy. There's so many other sins. And forgiveness is attainable after salvation, but perfection is a goal rather than a lifestyle. Because none of us can live a perfect life. Closest person to doing it in the Bible was Job. And then, you know, Jesus, of course, lived the perfect life. But we are not capable of that. So it leaves us with some questions. How could any of us fit the qualifications to fill a task of God? We are under, we under our own power. We can't do it. We are not powerful and great enough to do it on our own. To fulfill the role that God has for us, we are undeserving. But though we are not worthy, but chosen. That is my message for you tonight. We're going to talk about all the people, some people in the Bible and in real life, how we're not worthy of God, but God chooses us. So can everyone stand for the reading of God's word, if those who can? I just have one simple scripture, and it may not be referred back to a lot, but I believe it summarizes everything in a way that it needs to be. It comes from 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful of light. Can we pray? 
the Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord, and take this word and hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against you, Lord God. Prepare our hearts and our minds for listening and our, our words for speaking, Lord God, and just help us to take this word and just to dwell on it, Lord, and help it to marinate on us and help us to become better Christians and be more Christ-like like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first point, I'm going to pull several Bible stories for you tonight. So we're going to kind of do a little bit of Bible hopping. We're not going to be in one specific passage. Um, but the first point I want to make is that God uses the weak. I want to start out with the story of David. David was a little young. He was a young boy, you know, younger than me. And he wasn't known for his stature. He wasn't known for his royalty. He wasn't known for anything great. And at the time, Saul was re God was rejecting Saul as, as the king. So it was time to find a new king. And Samuel was going around as God's prophet to find the king. And Je um, Jesse had several sons, and God told him to look at them, and he would tell him which one was going to be the king. So he went over here. They had him lined up. He was like, it's not him. It's not him. It's not him. It's not him. David wasn't even there. His father was, he couldn't even imagine him being a king. It seemed to appear that way. He had to watch the um, sheep. That was his job. He already had a job, and it was very important. And although it was very important, it didn't seem that he was in a position to be king. And but David, he had already done mighty things. He had killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands through the power of God. And we look at 1 Samuel 16, 16, 7, and it said, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. And we later, later find out that David had a heart after God. That's why he was king. He wasn't king because of what he looked like. He wasn't king because of what he was at the time. He went on to kill a giant, you know, boy, probably yehi ish killed a giant that was about nine feet tall. God uses the little things. Then we're going to hop over to the little boy with the five loaves and two fish. Another young child. Give me one moment, please. Singing and talking, drying my mouth out. <laughs> he was another young child, and he had just got him packed this small lunch relatively, for him to go and listen to Jesus speak to the 5,000. He was also a little boy, and his mother had probably just packed that lunch and sent him on his way so he could hear the gospel. And he didn't have enough to feed everyone, obviously. He didn't have enough probably to feed more than two people or three people if he had to split it. But Jesus used the food from that little boy. Jesus probably had other options he could have found. He could have found a way to make food appear like that. You know, he has that power. He made manna fall for the sky for years and years and years to the Israelites. But Jesus had a different point in mind here. He wanted to use the little thing. He wanted to use the small thing, what people considered weak, to prove a point. You know, he could have, you know, Jesus was the one that performed the miracle and fed 5,000 with 12 baskets left over. But there were several other ways he could have done that. He just chose this way to prove that he's God and he can do what he wants through the smallest things. Because... Sometimes something out of something small is more than something out of nothing because it defies expectations. Next, we go to the woman at the well. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along, and Jesus was traveling through Samaria in order, you know, to go where he was going, and he had, he stopped by a well. He saw a woman there, and he said, can you get me some water? And she said, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. You know, we don't have this, you know, kind of relationship between our people. And he began to talk to her about living water. And she was still thinking, oh, um, well, this is real water. This is, I need to get this from the well. How am I going to get it? We don't have something that's long enough to get it from the well for you to get it for me. So he went on to tell her about how he revealed himself as the Messiah and how the living water would help her to never thirst again. And she was, I'm sure she was still skeptical at this point because she thought he was a prophet. She already had said that. But he then said, she, he said, go tell your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you live with is not your husband. And then she went and witnessed to the people and told them, look at what the man who knows everything about me, you know, come see him. And the point I want to make here is we live in a different day and age. Women back then weren't supposed to minister and witness the way that she did. It was not known of. And beyond that, in the Gentiles, this was not a Jewish people that were looking for a Messiah to come. So God used another person who they would not expect to deliver his message. 
Moses had a stutter. I mean, it's kind of glanced over. We don't talk about it a lot. He had to speak on behalf of a nation in front of the Pharaoh. Him and the Pharaoh may have been brothers, but they were, um, you know, not by blood, but they were distant at that time. That's, that's a big deal to speak in front of someone who's in charge of that many people who has the power to kill you like that. And he couldn't even speak clearly. He didn't even want to do it. He doubted himself. He wanted his brother Aaron to speak. He thought he was more fit for the job. But God believed in Moses, and you continued to use him to lead a nation. The last person I want to point out is Jesus himself. They didn't expect Jesus to come as a little baby in a manger in the humblest way possible. I'm sure they expected some warrior, some mighty, powerful, you know, being to come down and be the Messiah. No, he came as a man that lived off of the principles of love, grace, and humility, and forgiveness. So, as you can see, God uses the weak because in their weakness, his true, his, um, true glory and strength is revealed. Secondly, God uses those who messed up. And this may be even more relatable for all of us because we've all messed up. We all mess up every day, you know, in some way, form, or fashion. Whether it may not be a sin, but we all do something that we regret. We think back on it and we're like, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. I looked so stupid. I looked really dumb in that situation. Or I didn't mean to say that in that way to that person. And it really hits us hard when we're laying in the night and we just sit back and think about our day. One of the biggest ones, the story of Paul. He led to the per persecution and death of an uncountable number of Christians. God had struck him down, and Saul lost his sight. So he went on this journey to, return, to receive his sight. But during this journey, he found his spiritual sight as well as, as his physical sight. He became the guide to the early Christian church and one of the greatest apostles in the Bible. And he's the first to tell his story. He's the first to say it the way because he's never admitted that he was some great, you know, powerful person, you know, in terms of being a Christian. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16, he said, Here is a trustworthy worthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ, might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He said he was the worst. You know, he put himself at the bottom of the totem pole because he received that humility that Jesus had. He established the early church and he made all of this possible through God. You know, God did that through him. But he wasn't that great of a man before. He did the opposite. He was the opposite of a Christian, totally opposite. Not only did he not believe in God, but he despised those who believed in God and killed them. What about a man by the name of Jonah? who fled from God's calling. He heard that he was supposed to go to Nineveh. He was supposed to spread the word of gospel there and try to get them to change their ways. And he knew how bad Nineveh was. These people were doing unthinkable things there. And he fled. He went to Tarshish. He hopped on a ship and planned to go there so that he could avoid God's calling in his life. This was a big mistake because he got on that ship. A giant storm came about. And he was sleeping in the bottom of the ship. And he was resting. And they come down and said, how can you sleep in a time like this? Things are going terrible around us, and you're just down here sleeping. They went up, and they cast lots to see whose fault it was. And the lots fell on Jonah. And they were like, what did you do to do all this? He told them the situation, and how he ran, and how he went to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. And they said, well, what do we do to fix this? And he said, throw me off the ship. And they were like, we're not going to do that, first of all. We're going to try to get to land first. But it didn't work out, so they had to throw him off the ship. See, it's important to point out that they had already prayed out to their gods. But after they threw Jonah off their ship, they prayed to his god. They made a vow to his god. So already, by correcting his mistake, he has changed the lives, possibly, of these sailors. It doesn't even... It happens before he gets to Nineveh. Then his change comes when he's in the belly of a well for three days and three nights and he reconciles through God with prayer and meditation on God it's the time he needs to get his mind right because we need that time sometimes sometimes we need that time to ourselves where we're like we're, I'm not living my life right I got to do this right after we mess up but sometimes we tend to dwell too much on the messing up rather than the getting it right so he got this right and he went and the people from Nineveh they turned their ways Jonah was angry about it but he did what God wanted him to do, and God's purpose was delivered through someone who failed. Once again, then Peter denied Christ. He's, he already told him, I'm not going to deny you. There's no way I'm going to deny you. 
But at the time, he didn't know that Jesus was going to be taken away. And he was running for his life, terrified that if someone knew who he was, he was going to get killed. So the morning came, and he realized what he had done by the time the rooster had crowed. And he had his point where he got his life right. And he apologized for his mistake and got forgiveness for his sin. And he went on to, he became the leader of disciples and spoke a powerful, his first evangelical message saved 3,000 people because God used the person that messed up. We're going to circle back around to King David again because he became a mighty king, was doing everything God wanted him to, but then temptation struck. He he committed adultery and murder because he had relation with his soldier's wife, Bathsheba, and he wouldn't come back to cover it up. So he went ahead and killed him as well. So David's in a tough situation here because, you know, she's going to have it. She has to tell by him and he's already committed these sins, but he gets confronted by the prophet Nathan about what he's done. And he confesses, he, you know, cries and weeps out to God. And then the baby gets sick. And he cries and weeps out to God and fast and does everything, strips himself down before God in order to try to reconcile and save that child. But the child didn't live. But that's because even though God uses us after we made our mistakes, there's still consequences for our mistakes. We still have to deal with what we started. But it doesn't mean that God won't be there to help you through every consequence. He's there to protect you and guide you through the trials. And sometimes the trials aren't there by God. Sometimes we lay the trials down ourselves when he had an easier path for us. And we always, you, you know, you can get to the point through a straight line, God's way, which doesn't mean there won't be barriers, or you can get to the point your way, where you curve all off, and you go over here, and then you finally get back on track, and you might go off the other way, you know? So, he had to face the consequences. I want to have a, a quick illustration for you. Can I have four volunteers? Anyone? Anderson, you up front? Junior? And, all right. So, this is kind of, we're going to look at what people see people who mess up and who are young and weak through a societal lens. How we see them as Christians and a society. So, some of us have committed major sins. Junior, can you come with me? We look at them down here, right? They're, they're at the bottom, at the steps. They've committed murder, and they've done these unthinkable things. You know, kind of at the point where Paul was. All right, next we have people who suffer from, you know, stuff like eating disorders, depression, things that may not be their fault, but we still look at them in a different way. Can you go on the first step for me? All right. Next we have the people who, sorry, are too small or too young. They shouldn't be able to be here. They, let's put them right here. They're kind of on a down one step. They're, they're about right here. And the people that we think are too old fall in this category too. Don't think Abraham, no one thought Abraham was going to do the things he did. I'm not singling anyone out. We have young and old in here. And then we have the person who, right here, who we consider to be the ideal Christian. All right? So here we have someone who's committed major sins, not even know God. Then we have someone here who suffered through depression, anxiety, and they think that they're not going to be useful for anything, not just by everyone else, but through themselves. Then we have someone here who's too young or too old. No one believes in them. Then we have the ideal Christian. You can flip these around somewhat, but this is a general statement. So, but when God looks at them, he doesn't look at them through his lens. He changes his glasses, and he said, this person right here can do as much as this person. This person right here can do as much as this person. Go one more step. And the worst of everyone, that we consider the worst of everyone, <laughs> not you, can be just as great and just as powerful and have just as much of his influence as the person who is a great Christian. All right. Can y'all come stand here at the bottom again? So... Can I have everyone come up to the front, please? Those who can. Um, can the kids come up to the front first? And then everyone who can, come around to them to pray for them.
can we just pray for their vision? That's something we've been talking about in the youth group a lot recently. Can we pray that they realize what God has chosen them for and anointed them for in our life? And after we pray for them, can we please pray for each other? Because, you know, God's not done with any of us yet. If we weren't here, he would be, you know, he's done with us when we're not here anymore. So as long as you're living on this earth, you have a purpose and God is still using you. I mean, let's pray. Dear Lord God, we know that you have a purpose for each and every one of these children, Lord God. We know that you are going to do something great in their lives, something powerful, something wonderful, something magnificent, Lord God. Lord, help them to realize it. Some may be doctors, some may be lawyers, some may be ministers, singers, and, you know, something of every denomination and every culture, Lord. But please let them to realize it and do whatever they do according to your will, Lord God. Because it doesn't matter what we do as long as we do it for you, Lord God. Lord, just bring them this grace and humility in their lives and their lovingness that Paul and Jesus and all the prophets had, Lord God. Bring them into great, mighty women, men and, men and women of God, Lord God. And everyone out here, Lord, help them to find their purpose. Help them to find what they're supposed to do. Help them to just grow closer to you, Lord God, and to never let go of their Bibles and their scripture. Help them to come to church and fellowship those who can, Lord, and find ways to reach out to you. Have the moments of worship in the car where they can't contain themselves praising out to you, Lord God, because it's important that we maintain our relationship with you. Lord, we want to grow it every single day, Lord Jesus. Junior, come on up here, Benny. Junior didn't want to be the worst of them. But Junior's going to be a preacher. He's already told me so. Reading his Bible through. He's going to be one of the best of them. I want us to sing that song at the cross because that means so much to these kids. And that's really what it takes is the blood of the cross. No matter how far down we go, no matter how good we are. Could I have those other young men back up here? Amen. They win that illustration. Yeah, that'll work. All this will work. It's not, now, you, you're good. Amen. We're going to sing at the cross. But what I want you to see from this sermon, I want you to get this point, that God takes little things. He takes weak things. And he takes insignificant things. And he makes them great. Because he's great. And it's when we come to the cross and we realize I can't save myself no matter how good I am. I can't save myself no matter how young or old I am. I can't save myself if I've just committed a little sin or if I've committed the worst of sins. I need a Savior. His name is Jesus. I need the blood of the cross applied to my heart. And the more I walk with him, the more I appreciate the blood and the cross. Let's sing it together. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light.
number two. Verse number two. Sing it. Wrong. For Christ said I have done. He grown up on the tree. Amazing did he grace unknown. Yes. But beyond the degree. Hallelujah. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw. Put it up, brother. Verse number four, verse three. But drops of green can marry paint the bed of the high Dear Lord, I give myself to pain. It's all that I come on, sing it at the cross, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw. Junior just aged up. This past weekend, he went on his first camping trip. And <laughs> caught his first fish. <laughs> and he caught the most fish of anybody there. So when he becomes a fisher of men, you sinners better look out. Hallelujah. Yes. I, I, know, I saw him that now. He did not want to be the worst of those four guys. And I saw him that <laughs> And they hit home with him. He's going to turn out to be a good one. Amen. Shake my hand, Junior. Now, if you want to know how to shake a man's hand, he'll give you a real handshake. Oh, Jose, the first time I shook his hand, he put his, his hand in there like, I don't know if you've ever shook someone's hand, and they just put it in there like a wet dish rag. I said, come here, Jose. I said, let me teach you how to shake. And I gave him a nice, firm handshake, and I told him when Junior started coming along, I said, teach him how to shake hands. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's a good bond. Pastor Nate, thank you so much for great service tonight, didn't they? The youth do a great job and they, the praise and the worship music ahead of time there. Hallelujah. Let's fellowship. Look at three people and tell them you're blessed and highly favored of God. And fellowship with one another.